We're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a toothache, it never gives, goes away. <clears throat> 150 or so uh, weeks later. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Hey, uh, hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Sunday night offering of astronomy outreach for November the 27th, the Sunday night astronomy show. Yay! Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> My name is Chris Kerwin. I'm the creator and admin of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay, and I'm an amateur astronomer and member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the New Brunswick chapter. Yay! Um, <laughs> first of all, I'd like to introduce our regular co-host and fellow RASP member, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in beautiful St. John. Hey, Mike. Hey, it's always hey. Paul first. <laughs> yeah, I switched it up tonight. You changed her up. I love it. <laughs> And I'd like to introduce our other regular co-host and fellow RAS member, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moon Shadow Observatory in beautiful Hampton NB. Hey, Paul. Hey. 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 Okay, enough of that. <laughs> All right. On tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. Now, when I was young, Pluto was still a planet. I remember saying yes. that to myself. Uh, it seems to be a sore spot with many people that Pluto was demoted to become a minor planet or a dwarf planet. But there was a reason for it, and to understand why, we have to understand what constitutes a planet. Now, in tonight's episode, we're going to take a closer look at that topic and how we need to expand our definition as we discover many more of them. Uh, we're also going to dive into exoplanets and what we're finding about them as well. Uh, also this evening, Mike will bring uh, Bino Bud back for another fine binocular target of the week, and he'll also have this week's lunar challenge to share. Uh, also, Paul will be offering another interesting Rosanna's Fun Fact segment tonight. Um, there's also been a number of meteor sightings shared with me over the past couple of weeks. Uh, people have been sending me emails and videos and pictures and stuff. Um, so I wanted to suggest where people can send reports because people were asking me, have other people seen it? Uh, so I'm going to get into that just to, with a couple of slides on, on uh, in our photo session showing you where to report uh, fireballs if you see them and how you can go back and take a look a few days later to see if other people have seen them. Um, also, I'm going to have a look at what's up uh, this week. And I'll also have, of course, all of your wonderful photo submissions to share as well. So this is a family-friendly live, interactive live broadcast. So for those of you joining me or joining us, sorry, from my YouTube channel or Facebook page, we're happy to try and answer all of your astronomy questions in real time as well. And of course, we'd like to welcome back all those who've been joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Thank you for your support. Yee. Ah, so let's get started then with tonight's program and a look at what happened to poor Pluto. First of all, this is going to bring, bring some controversy out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mike's already biting his finger. <laughs> <laughs> and how the definition of planets is changing with the revolution and discoveries of new exoplanets. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Pluto, and Paul's going to introduce our um, exoplanet part of the, the discussion. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, give it your best shot. I'll give it my best <laughs> shot. Okay. <laughs> I better share my screen first of all here. Can I have to do that? I guess. Sure. Where's it going to go? I'm not sure. I think it's going to go here. 
And I think we can go one second. How do I go slideshow? In the beginning, I should bring it up. Here, how's that? We'll give a minute to pop up. There we go. Yep, okay. So, yeah, Pluto on Pluto. Pluto on Pluto. Uh, so what happened to poor Pluto, uh, our ninth planet? Well, uh, first of all, let's just talk a little bit about what is Pluto. Well, Pluto is a dwarf planet in the Kuiper Belt, a uh, ring of bodies beyond the orbit of Neptune. Now, it's the ninth largest planet and the tenth most massive known object to directly orbit the Sun. Now, it is largest known. It is the largest known trans-Neptunian object, which means it passes through the path of Neptune uh, by volume, by a small margin, but is slightly less massive than Eris, which is another body we'll talk about here shortly. Like other uh, Kuiper Belt uh, objects, Pluto is made primarily of ice and rock and is much smaller than the inner planets. Now compared to Earth's moon, Pluto has only about one sixth of its mass and one third of its actual volume. So Pluto has a moderately eccentric and inclined orbit ranging from uh, 30 to 49 astronomical units, which is uh, the distance between us and the sun, which uh, equals out to about 4.5 to 7.3 billion kilometers from the sun. Now light from the sun takes about five and a half hours to reach Pluto at its average distance. Pluto's eccentric orbit periodically brings it closer to the sun than Neptune, but a stable orbital, orbital resonance presents them from colliding. So Pluto has five known moons, Charon, the largest moon, whose diameter is just about half the, uh, that of Pluto, uh, Styx, Nix, uh, Kiberos, and Hydra. Um, Pluto was discovered in 1930, the first object in the Kuiper Belt. It was immediately hailed as the ninth planet, but its planetary status was questioned when it was found to be much smaller than expected. Now, these doubts increased following the discovery of additional objects in the Kuiper Belt starting in the 1990s, and particularly the more massive scattered disk object Eris in uh, 2005. That's it there on the left. So Pluto's status as a planet was kind of short-lived. It went from discovery to, to demotion in less than 80 years. Spotted in 1930, Pluto enjoyed mere decades of fame as our ninth planet before being stripped of its status and downgraded to a dwarf planet in 2006. Now, in January of 1930, Clyde Tombaugh captured several images that revealed a, fainting, a faint moving object. Now, blinking between the two plates, the object shifted across the plates, showing the telltale motion expected for a ninth planet. Tombaugh had found Pluto. But astronomers began wondering whether Pluto was indeed a planet or just a really large asteroid at a surprisingly large distance from the sun. Now, the discovery of the Kuiper Belt and the ring that begins just past Neptune and stretches to more than 150 billion kilometers away from the sun, further raised questions about Pluto. Astronomer Mike Brown in 2005, he came up across a surprisingly bright and slow moving object. He recognized that this survey had found a new Kuiper Belt object and that it was enormous. The object later dubbed Eris was the largest uh, Kuiper Belt object ever found at that time. So this began to put Pluto in an awkward position where Eris was thought to be as large or even larger than Pluto. Lots of other worlds also came into question. Now, if Pluto was a planet, well, how about Albion, uh, Ceres, and many other Kuiper Belt objects similar in size? So the meeting to define a planet had to take place. Well, the de definition of a planet was the subject of an infamous vote carried out in 2006 at a meeting of the International Astronomical Union now, astronomers realized that a clear definition of what constituted a planet was long overdue, and a number of experts weighed in on proposed criteria for what we might call a planet. So what is the definition of a planet? Well, the meaning to define a planet said the body decided on three definitions on what constitutes a planet. Number one, it had to orbit a star. No problem for Pluto, it orbits our sun. Number two, it had to be massive enough to hold itself together under its own gravity and assume a roughly round shape, which is Pluto as well. Number three, though, is where it had trouble. It had to clear its neighborhood by gravitationally dominating its orbit and moving other objects out of its way. 
Pluto had no problem handling the first two requirements, but it could not possibly clear its orbit in the densely packed Kuiper belt. So the vote was taken, the vote was passed, and Pluto was demoted. So Pluto is now considered to be a dwarf planet, along with Ceres, Eris, and many other objects in the Kuiper belt. There's just a few of them here. So that's where we ended up with Pluto. Poor little guy. Poor little feller. <laughs> you watch it, Mercury, you're coming next. <laughs> Well, so, okay, let's uh, let's take an argument or two. Let me uh, stop sharing here first of all. I can find out how to do it again. Down here somewhere. Uh, stop sharing. There we go. Okay, I'm back. You're back. I'm back. Hey, so, <laughs> Mr. Powell. Well, I I still argue that Pluto was a planet, and there's a couple of reasons why. Number one. It's, uh, as they would say, fake news, or, you know, as Donald Trump would say, or the voting was rigged. The vote took place on August uh, 2006 in Prague, and out of the 9,000 possible voting members, there was only 424 members that voted. And out of that, it was barely a majority. So <laughs> these are the people that changed the rules and made Pluto a dwarf planet. Number two is the one that I stick on the most, which was the rule that made Pluto no longer a planet. They said it has not cleared its orbit, orbital uh, path of debris. Well, number one, neither is the Earth. We get asteroids and meteorites coming through our solar, you know, or our atmosphere every day. So we haven't cleared our path either. We're still in the process of clearing it. Uh, Pluto said, uh, yeah, it comes in and it hasn't uh, taken its orbit over because Neptune is, is there. Well, if you reverse it, Neptune hasn't cleared its orbit of Pluto either. So is Neptune a planet or a dwarf planet? <laughs> Size didn't matter when it came to their vote. It was strictly clearing the, uh, its path of an orbital debris. That was the only thing that stopped Pluto from being a planet. No other. It, it met the first two. It's round, right? Yeah, and, uh, to start. It, it does everything a planet should do except clear its path of orbital debris. And I would argue that even Jupiter, the Earth, Saturn, none of that has cleared its path of orbital debris. Every one of them have meteors coming through the atmosphere. Meteorites land on Earth all the time. 140 tons of space dust lands on the Earth every day, every week. So we haven't cleared our path either. So are they suggesting that another object might be there that it can't push out of the way? Or are they suggesting that... Um, was, like we like we get debris, of course, we've just come through a meteor shower. So you know, lots lots of stuff right. impacts our, I, our I, planet. Some I argue from the point last of week. a lawyer, okay? point of a lawyer is be straight with your definitions. If there's a possibility of something different, then that changes the definition. Their definition hasn't changed. It did not clear its path of debris. That's the only reason it's like. So, so then I guess the question is, what is considered... A uh, significant path of debris. Right, but they didn't go into that. They didn't classify that. That would be the question I would ask, because that's, that's the only that's the only unknown. Because I if, agree. There is, if there's a classification for debris where it's at right now that is far more massive or dense than the debris that the rest of the solar system is in, then maybe that's their argument. But if it's not, you know, then then that's another thing. But that's that would be the question that I would ask is. What is the definition of debris? debris. I mean, so, 100 tons of space dust hits the Earth every single day. On, yeah. on top of that, uh, the meteor that killed the dinosaurs, uh, was Earth not a planet until after that? <laughs> because that's a big piece of space debris. It was yeah. the size of Mount Everest. Yeah. <laughs> but does it mean anyway, that, that... That's my argument back. If I was sitting in yeah. a courtroom, I would say, what's the difference between Pluto, what Pluto has done and what the other planets have supposedly done? And yeah. in, according to their definition, Pluto still, you know, no other planet has cleared its path of all their debris either. So then none of them are planets. That's my argument. But I mean, no, <laughs> hang on a sec. So let's say has it hasn't cleared its path of debris. Like has Earth cleared its path? We can go around the sun yeah. and not be impacted by objects that are in our path. Right, but Space there are there are path. lots of them that do pass through our path, but they they're coming from other places and passing through. Right, they're not they're not in the same orbit as we are as we're passing around the sun. We've only gone out to Pluto 
once and photographed it. So we've only been close to it once. We don't know what's in its path or what it's cleared. It could be a very narrow path that it's following and asteroids on both sides of it from the Kepler belt. Mm. Right? Mars is being bombarded every day. Is that because of the asteroid belt and things moving? Things in space are moving all the time. How do you, I'm just going by their definition. And the only definition they come up with was no other argument. So according to their definition, Pluto. Uh, I think Mark <laughs> on here says con controversy. Yep, very so. Maybe conspiracy. Well, <laughs> And it'll always be a planet to me. I don't care. <laughs> so why I just don't like, I, I like to debate the fact that, you know, how they said it and mm -hmm. how, the, the, how they determined it is not covering the full spectrum of why it may be a dwarf planet or not. Mm. That's all. It's interesting. It, 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 I mean, it, it, does it clarify what is, is classed as a planet, though? Like... I mean, these are dwarf planets, and if you wanted to say that Pluto is a planet, well, then you've got to say Ceres is a planet, Eris is a planet, a Maki Maki is a planet, you know, like maybe all the are. ones that, and <laughs> you're out there, you know, hundreds, maybe hundreds of planets that are that far out, so. Maybe they are. Mm. Just because you put the word dwarf in front of it, which we're not allowed to use anymore, politically. <laughs> <laughs> oh, minor planet, I guess, maybe. You know, size challenged planets? I don't know. <laughs> Mike says, if Jupiter is a big ball of gas, wouldn't wouldn't it? It wouldn't be able to clear a path. So hmm. what I'm looking at here is um, now I a new uh, Neptune and all of the other planets are not in the Kuiper Belt. Pluto is in the Kuiper Belt. Right. So that must be because of the density, um, because the asteroid belt doesn't contain any of our planets. Correct. The asteroid belt doesn't have oh no series series is there right yeah yeah but it's not considered a planet is it is a planet a minor planet? it's a minor planet minor but it's not it's not like it's not say classified as uh, a planet that's uh, one of the eight in our solar system that is a uh, one of the nine planets they say is in our solar system right right eight yeah. planets <laughs> nine <laughs> we're, we're old school so we we think nine because that's what we were taught. But sure. I'm looking at this image, and if I can share my screen, yep. I'm just going to open up my screen here or try to. My mouse isn't working very well. And it should be right there. And let me share that. And then I'll blow that picture or try to blow the picture up. I don't know if I can or not. No, I can't. But can it's you see just, that right there? Yep. It goes out to the Kepler belt, but it's not always in there. No, it, 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 it orbits in and out of it. So it's yeah. never clear the path of the Kuiper belt, right? Mm. So, but if you look at, um, so what's the closest other planet, inner planet that we have to the asteroid belt? I guess it would be between the inner and the outer. The asteroid belt with Mars. Right, so does Mars, Mars Jupiter, orbit, yeah. does Mars ever orbit through that debris? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, and again, I'm not saying one way or another, but I'm just trying to see why they would say uh, never clears debris if if like you guys are saying that there's always debris in space and we're always going to be going through it but it must be a certain class of debris or a certain density of debris is the reason they said that and, and i'm just making an assumption this doesn't this is not uh this is not uh, uh verifying anything right it's just this is just what they're saying on this one little statement so yeah, um, it's a difficult one. Yeah, <laughs> I think, well, it's, it's, I think it's, it's a, debate, it's, it's right? a gray area. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it's yeah. a debate. Yeah. And I mean, if only 415 out of 9,000, Mike, you said, actually voted. Right. Why did so, why did so many abstain? It's the question to me. Like, if there were, there were a lot more there, I think, than 400, were there not? Well, uh, there's 9,000 members and only hmm. 460, whatever it was, voted. But is that the number that was at the... Uh, at the conference, or yeah, that's who was at the. Con uh, I didn't say if anyone abstained at the conference. Mm. It says uh, Mary King says Mike the Star Lord, Mike the President of the Solar System. Yeah, the <laughs> holder of the underdog planet. <laughs> <laughs> Here, Kurt. As Kurt, I, Kurt I uh, just look Kurt. at it from the perspective of their definition is not uh, does not explain enough. To, to, yeah. to give that reason, that's all. Yeah. Simple Kurt, as that. 
Well, I think that's why the people who did vote on it were so close in yeah. terms of, because you said it was 51%. Right. 51%, and that's all you need. Is that just when you take an over right. a company, you get 51%, you have control. That's okay, right. so, so so Kurt's weighed in here. And Kurt, oh, yeah. has an, Kurt has an asteroid named after him, so we got to pay attention to him. Yes, we do. <laughs> Not a planet. <laughs> okay. What do you say? So, Kurt's on YouTube. He's saying uh, uh, that is, quote, cleared the neighborhood. Quote, unquote, of its own orbital zone, that means, or that is, removed other bodies of comparable size. Okay, so not not of any other debris, small asteroids, or... What have we found around Pluto, then? That it's the same uh, size as Pluto? Could it could it clear <laughs> debris of its... Uh, yeah, well, maybe it's because it's trans-Neptune. Is that, is that why? Because tra Neptune and Pluto sometimes yeah. shift positions, right? Well, that would be my other argument is... It, Neptune hasn't cleared his path of Pluto either. <laughs> yeah. Pluto does. Well, it's, it's, it, it's it of comparable size. So yeah. Neptune is much larger than Pluto. Well, this is true. Anyway, that was, it was just for sake of argument to say, yeah. you know, something. if you're going to define something, you should, I would look at it and say, you should come up with all the answers first and then define it rather than just define it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting. I think that's why we're, no matter where you look, it always says it's up for debate because sure. they, there's still right. no um, definitive reason. Yes, no, maybe yeah. so, black and white. It's That's all right. that, well, maybe and maybe, but we feel and, you know, so it's opinion. Yeah, two out of three. You, of know, them you know me, if you say it's black, I'll say it's white just for sake of <laughs> Just for sake of <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. I mean, what yeah. the heck, eh? But, I mean, well, two out of three is, is uh, yeah. That's the fun. You know, I, I, they, they had a debate about uh, Santa Claus being real or not, and he won the debate for one simple reason. The Canadian government uh, postal service gave him a postal code. If you didn't exist, you wouldn't have a postal code. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so Santa Claus okay. is real. I like Kurt, <laughs> Kurt's commented back again. Pluto's orbit is locked into Neptune's orbit. Uh, there you go. There you are. Okay. So the Neptune hasn't cleared his path. <laughs> <laughs> you can That's take great. that one. You can take that one up with the Kurt later on. <laughs> what are those two Buy dogs? him a coffee. Sit down and talk to him. What are the two dogs' names on uh, uh, Bugs Bunny. Oh Spike? yeah, Nash. <laughs> oh, uh, Spike and, Spike what's, and uh, what, yeah, what's the other one? That is what is the I other know, one? The Chihuahua and the uh, Bulldog yeah. or something. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think Kurt asked Mike. that question one time. I think Kurt did ask that question one time at one of the meetings. No, <laughs> did. I, I looked it up last night and I forgot it already. <laughs> okay, that's a good discussion. It's a, it's a great debate. Um, I think people do feel pretty passionate on one side or the other about it. Uh, yeah. And uh, mostly on the fact that they're poor little Pluto, you know. Yeah, all um, right. But, uh, it's been around a long time. We've talked about yeah. plants within our solar system. Let's talk about... Uh, Chester, there you go. Thanks, Kurt. Chester. <laughs> Chester. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so let's talk about, you know, planets, not planets that are existing that we're debating, but planets that we're finding. Mm -hmm. And um, so those are exoplanets. And there is a definition what an exoplanet is. And um, so I'm not going to say it. I'm going to see if out there, if, they can, if somebody can define what an exoplanet is. Because I know a lot of people hear the word exoplanet. But what does it actually mean? So can somebody chime in and give us a definition of what an exoplanet is or the definition of an exoplanet? We'll wait for a minute. So okay, okay, wait for a minute. Who's gonna who's got an explanation for what an exoplanet is? You're, you're probably all Googled it. <laughs> it's an exo that's cleared its path of debris. <laughs> <laughs> Stop, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> all right so according to um i can get my my mouse is not working very well uh can i go back anymore on this probably not let's just see oh that's why because i was looking at pluto so here is nasa's definition of what an exoplanet is did anybody chime in by the way i'm looking through comments here I'm trying to find if uh, it orbits a star outside the solar system, Lisa says. Okay, not all the time. <laughs> this is interesting stuff because um, not all planets or not all exoplanets actually orbit stars. They have um, uh, what they call, um, what, what's the word, Rogue. random, not random, rogue. 
they have rogue planets that are out there that actually don't orbit um, any star. star. Mm. But here's the definition from NASA. What an exoplanet is, an exoplanet is any planet that's beyond our solar system and most, most orbit other stars, but free floating exoplanets called rogue planets orbit the galactic center and are untethered to any star. So that's kind of a long-winded way to give you an explanation of what an exoplanet is. Um, I want it, I, I got one picture I wanted to show because it was interesting because when we say exoplanets, we're just kind of thinking they're just another planet, but we don't know what it is or what it consists of. So I'm gonna see if I can make this picture any bigger. Oh, I can, good. And then I'm gonna show it to you or as soon as I can get my mouse to do what it should do. There we go. That might be large enough. Maybe, maybe not. Hang on. Bear with me. No, it's not going to do it. Darn you, darn you. Um, no, there's no. Um, okay. I think I just ruined the picture too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, darn, darn, darn. Let's see if I can find it. Okay. Well, anyway, I'll just tell you what it says. So uh, with exoplanets, I'm just going to share what I've got. You, you can only see part of it now, unfortunately, but I'll show it to you anyway. So where do I share my screen? There it is. If I can click on that and click on that and open this. Okay. I don't know. For some reason, I can't make the, the, the picture larger or smaller anymore. It's kind of locked in. And it's only because I don't know how to use sticky notes. But with exoplanets, uh, you actually have um, some planets that are uh, the size of Earth or smaller. And then some of the ones, the exoplanets they have that they're finding that are 1.5 to two times larger than our Earth are large enough that they can actually um, uh, draw in, uh, I think it's methane, not methane, hang on a sec here hydrogen and helium. And those planets that are um, large enough to actually draw those in as an atmosphere will actually balloon out and then they will become gas giants. The ones that are actually uh, earth size or smaller don't have the atmospheric capability to draw those uh, things in. And then they typically will be or become uh, rocky planets like, the, like our inside planets uh, towards the sun. And so, um, but there's, 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 there's all kinds of different sizes of them out there. And, and I thought that that was kind of cool. Now, it says each planet type varies in interior and exterior appearance, depending on its composition. Gas giants are planets that are the size of Saturn and Jupiter and the largest planet in our solar system, or even much, much larger than that. And more variety is hidden within these uh, broad categories. Hot Jupiters, for instance, were among the first uh, types that they found, uh, gas giants orbiting so closely to their stars that their temperatures soar into the thousands of degrees. And in fact, um, a lot of them have lava surfaces. That's what, that's what runs on these things, on some of them. Neptunian planets, of course, are similar in size to Neptune or Uranus in our solar system. They likely have a mixture of interior compositions, but all will have hydrogen and helium uh, dominated outer atmospheres and rocky cores. So they start out with a rocky core, but it's large enough that they can uh, attract those gases. We also are discovering uh, mini Neptunes, uh, planets smaller than Neptune and bigger than Earth. No planets of this size type exist in our solar system. And there are super Earths that are typically terrestrial planets that may or may not have atmospheres but they are more massive than Earth, but lighter than Neptune. And then finally, there are terrestrial planets, Earth, um, the terrestrial planets that are Earth size and smaller, composed of rock, silicate, water, and carbon, carbon. Further investigations will determine whether some of these possess atmospheres, oceans, or other signs of, ha of uh, habitability. So I found that that was kind of interesting, uh, the dichotomy of the different types of uh, exoplanets that are out there. Now, how do we find them? So, so there's, there's a number of ways uh, that they're looking for in discovering exoplanets. And some are um, uh, uh, 
uh, Earth-based, where they can find them. Some, of course, are space-based uh, telescopes. Uh, Kepler, I think, is, is, is that the one, Kepler? Yep, Kepler. Yeah. That's out there that you can find them. And then there are some that they actually uh, use a combination um, of those two uh, types of methods to find them. Now, there are some methods, and I just want to just touch base on the methods, and then we'll, and then, and then we'll just chat a little bit about that. Um, so there's what they call the direct method, which would be like if, if you had a telescope and you were out there and you're looking to see a planet, they call that a direct method. Um, there's gravitational lensing, which is the wobbling, and the wobbling is uh, created by um, the planet having enough gravitational pull on the star that it actually creates a wobble in its orbit. And, and so, that, so that's another way that they can uh, discover these things. Um, there's um, the Doppler shift. Actually, that's the Doppler shift is the gravitational pull. Sorry, uh, the transits uh, are, of course, those are the ones that most people think of when they think of discovering a exoplanet, where the um, the moon or the planet rather will travel in the face of the star and it changes its um, intensity for a period of time, and then the star will go back to its regular intensity. And this happens on a regular period, so they measure that period, and with those measurements, they can tell how far away it is, how long the orbit is, and they can tell a number of different things from it. Um, and uh, the TRAPPIST-1, you're, you're familiar with that? Mm. Um, so it's, uh, there are, are actually planetary systems that are out there. So it's not just one planet attached to it. In fact, what they discovered with all of this is that there's more planets than there is stars. Yeah based on that because a lot of the stars that are out there have a series just like our own solar system so our one sun has nine planets <laughs> eight, eight. Plus, plus one <laughs> anyway but but you can see that one star can just in our solar system contains that many uh planets so and in and just like our solar system it's no different with all the exoplanets and they're no different than our planets because based on what we've researched and we talked about today, the makeup of those planets and how they morph into what they're going to be as a planet is the same way that our solar system would develop. So one star, 10 planets. How many stars? How many planets? So, so I never looked, but have we actually physically seen another planet orbiting a star or are we just seeing the effects of the, on the star itself? Yeah, um, well, um, which is the yeah, planet um, uh, Procyon? Yeah. No, what is this? What is the star that's really low in the sky? Yeah, it's. it's well, we really have actually uh, photographed the planet beside a star. We photographed uh, it's, it's, it's a solar system. Here's oh, the wow. first. Here it is. The first exoplanet that was made well known uh, was 51 Pegasi B. Right. It's odd Jupiter orbiting a sun-like star 50 light years away. Now they saw the planet or did it just saw the effects on the star? I, I, that's a good question. It was the one that was made famous. And then of course there were thousands after that. I wonder if any of our viewers out there know that. An answer yeah, well, that I suppose, yeah, but we, we, that's a good question. There is, well a star that, the, there is a star that sits low in the Southern horizon in the winter, in the summertime. And I can't quite remember the name of it, but I know right. um, it did. I do remember seeing an image of the, its sun and a cloud of debris like around that sun and an area that was cleared out where it had cleared its path or was clearing its path on its, on its way around that particular sun. I can't quite remember the name of it. I'll know I'll, I'll get it after the show is over of course, but. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that you say that because I'll have to find it in uh, some of the stuff I was looking at today, but that's how they actually form. You can actually see these bands that are going around them or, or, or they can, you know, certain telescopes, certain ways to resolve this. There actually are bands that, uh, that they actually make uh, during their formation. Well, I know the, the most recent ones out there, is that not, not as well what Webb is helpfully designed to do to actually physically see, uh, you know, maybe a large planet orbiting another star? 
Webb's, Webb's beginning to pick out atmospheres around other uh, of planets around other stars. Yeah, that's what its its purpose is to really get not maybe not to actually visually see the planet I think, but more in be able to uh, in spectroscopy trying to determine exactly what right. that atmosphere is made out of. And they found ones just recently that have carbon dioxide and uh, I don't think they found oxygen yet, but well, carbon dioxide, but a few other gases that are common as as most uh rocky worlds have right that's yeah. incredible eh? yeah so it's, much out there <laughs> no, but kepler What's kepler that? was out there kepler had picked up uh formal hot that's it thank you kurt appreciate that <laughs> good to have kurt on here tonight formal hot that's the name of the start when are you uh, coming form, on the show formal, formal hot yeah <laughs> yeah when you come on the show you can use your help that's the one that they found a planet around another star they actually actually observed it right on um, Kepler had the distinction of uh, capturing or looking at 100,000 stars at the same time and looking for that intrinsic brightness uh, to drop, you know, the level of brightness to drop when when a planet would pass in front of it, like you, yeah. know, you said, Paul, but yeah, 100,000 yeah. stars at a time and it found like 1,700 planets. Uh, or, and then it went defunct, I guess. It, uh, um, but now it, it used to stare at one sp specific spot in the sky and now they've got Kepler 2 version or uh, 2.0. Where okay. It just stares at different parts of the sky, but yeah, uh, yeah. But um, the guy is actually another big spacecraft or another satellite that's picking up a lot of exoplanets as well. Uh, but mostly through the transient method, like you, like you mentioned, that's where we're finding a lot of them now. Yeah. But anyway, it's uh, it's an interesting topic, and it's um, oh, I, it I never really uh, looked uh, this closely as much as I had uh, at this little bit of research, and it's mm -hmm. really really quite interesting. And, it, and if you really think about it, when you compare it to our solar system, uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely not, we're not, we're not uh, unique. Our no. solar system is multiplied many times out there in the universe. So two to, two to 400 billion stars in our galaxy and at least one planet around every star, they're saying, at least one. And maybe nine. Some with, with maybe nine. <laughs> Great. You could, be talking, you could be talking close to a trillion planets in just our solar in our galaxy. And then we're talking about two trillion galaxies. So yeah. You know, what are the odds of you and I, you know, maybe there's no you and I out there sitting on Zoom right now on YouTube and Facebook <laughs> talking yeah. about planets, but you know, some other type of life. Well, I really find it. You'd be pretty arrogant, I think, to expect that there wouldn't be some type, but... Oh, yeah, indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, anyway, so that, that's uh, kind of um, what we, I think, put together about mm. this chat. If there's something, you know, you guys discover out there uh, that if you can add in or chime in, like, we'll keep an eye on the notes here and, and pass it through because mm. there are things, um, you know, they're just discovering every day. There seems to be something. Oh, gosh. Like yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Sky's the limit. Sky's the limit. Pluto's planet. Pluto's planet. Pluto's planet. We all believe that. I think we all believe it. T-shirts. We yeah. should have that. Pluto. We should have. Yeah. Pluto's forever. We have to believe it. Yeah. I'm in. Our I'm generation. In. Okay. Uh, let's go on then. With uh, how about a bino bud then? Bino bud. Bino bud. Okay, so binocular target of the week this week by Bino Bud. He should be coming up. Yeah, it is. Yep. Okay, Caroline's Rose. Yes, sir. Not a pretty object. <laughs> and the cat too. Is that what it looks like in the telescope? So NGC 7989, also known as Caroline's Rose or the White Rose Cluster, is an open cluster in Cassiopeia that was discovered by Caroline Herschel in 1783. Her brother, William Herschel, included it in his catalog as HV1 or a 5 or 6, whatever, 0 0.30. The, this cluster is also known as the White Rose Cluster or Carolyn's Rose Cluster. Uh, when seen visually, the loop of stars and dark lanes looks somewhat like the swirling pattern of a rose petal as seen from above. So there you go. How do I find it in the sky? Well, if you will note it. Right up, well, uh, say an hour ago, <laughs> and look 30 degrees northeast and look up, you see Cassiopeia, the big W or an M in this case. And if you come over here, there's a, the bright star, I think it's called Calf. Yep. And it's just off to the side of Calf. 
There's calf. There's Caroline's rose right in there. And it's a pretty good object, good size. You can see it well. This is what you're looking at. It's oh, basically beautiful. a beautiful star cluster. Yeah. And there's lots of the, like you say, the dark lanes going through it. Now, I don't see a rose in that picture, but I'd have to stare at it longer maybe, and it will come to, you know, do you see a dog or a horse, whatever. <laughs> in 10 by 50 binoculars, though, look at the size of this thing. That's huge. So it, it is an easy cluster to spot against the, the background stars. Compared to the full moon, well, I'd say double the full moon. Okay, in size. So an easy target to look at, easy to find off Cassiopeia, off that star calf, and you should be off to the races. And this is for those of us who keep buying <laughs> stuff. <laughs> that was Mike when someone said Pluto's not a planet. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Binocular Target of the Week by Bono Bud. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, Thanks. Good one. Okay. Um, are we ready for Rosanna's talk? Yes. Okay. Uh, before we do, though, Tim Libby, he said Kepler with a question mark. Chris, you want to answer that? What is Kepler? Oh, what is Kepler? Uh, well, it's a spacecraft that was designed. I'm not sure. I have to. I actually, I did a talk on it, I think, a while back, where are they now? One of my earlier talks. Um, but I can't remember anything from yesterday, let alone. I can't remember what <laughs> shirt, shirt I put on this morning. Um, where did I put it on this morning? Maybe it was yesterday. <laughs> Uh, Kepler was a spacecraft that was designed to uh, study exoplanets in, in the fact that uh, it was using a transient method to, to, uh, to find them. And basically, I've got a flashlight and, or a light, and I've got a planet passing in front of it, and it would look at the minute amount of dip that it would take. Um, it was almost like uh, picking out a fly passing in front of a, of a street light a kilometer away. That's about basically what you would see. Um, but it stared at 100,000 stars at the same time uh, and tried to determine what these transients were about and how long it would take, like you mentioned, how long it would take for that ha to happen. So we would look at the, the, the brightness changing, the amount that it changed, and then we would watch for that same amount again in, a, in 200 days or 300 days or 400 days, whatever it was, and we'd watch for that same dip that same signature and if it, we caught that same signature then we would know the orbit of that object and then we would also know uh the amount of dip we would know how big it is so then we could determine from that whether or not it was too big like it was a super earth or was it a hot jupiter or you know was it too large to be able to be considered for life as we know it kind of thing so that's how we started to narrow it down to rocky worlds and how many rocky worlds there were versus uh hot jupiters or or super earths or and it really did a, an excellent job. It discovered over 1,700 planets, um, you know, outside of our solar system. And, it, and I think the discoveries are still happening with Kepler two right now, but it's just not not as uh, effective as it was with with the original Kepler. Yeah. Um, okay. But, so that's, that's 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 great because that was what Tim was, I think, asking. Hmm. Uh, he said uh, Ross 508b uh, discovered August 3rd, 2022, super Earth exoplanet 37 light years away. So anyway, yeah. that's great. Well, that's that's your answer anyway, uh, Tim. I, if that was the question. Okay, um, so we're going to go with the Rosanna's uh, fun fact yeah. next. Paul said this is a timely one, I guess. Eh? Yeah, I think it is. And hers are always. Timely. Rosanna's fun fact. Yeah. <laughs> and we're back for another wonderful Rosanna's fun fact. And as usual, I don't know what it is. I think she's got, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, something chimed into my head. Because every time we talk about something, she's right on the ball. So let's get right into it. So she says, hi, Paul. As we approach December, many of us will receive, buy, or give uh, an, an advent calendar of some sort. Throughout history, people have marked the days until Christmas with chalk or candies, or candles rather. The first printed advent calendar originated in Germany in the 20th century with uh, Gerhard Lang. Now, Gerhard was a little boy. His mom made him, when Gerhard was a little boy rather, his mom made him a calendar with 24 small candies attached to cardboard and voila the beginning of something that is now a huge business began. The Advent season as it relates to Christianity is determined by the feast 
day, uh, day of St. Andrew, November the 30th, and St. Andrew was the patron saint of Scotland, Greece, and Russia, and we now have our own, actually, St. Stephen, which, you may, which officially and legally has saint spelled out and not abbreviated, but for tourism reasons, the town prefers just St. Saint. So although chocolate is probably the most popular choice for an advent calendar, the James Webb telescope images could be thought of as a gift that just keeps on giving. In recent setback, um, it recently sent back rather, the astonishing images of a cloud, material feeding, um, though as if a gift had just been given. It recently, oh, I just said that. And of material feeding uh, a proto star, in the background, as you can see, a multitude of galaxies. So there's a, all kinds of galaxies uh, in and behind this um, image. So finding this gorgeous photo in my inbox made me curious to see if anyone had ever created an astronomy advent calendar. Yes, back in 2010, the big picture published on the internet only its third year of advent images from the Hubble telescope. I wish I'd known about that. They also had a page where you could print out Hubble greeting cards for free. It's now defunct. But here is a 2010, December 1st Advent photo. So now, um, and this is from ESA and uh, NASA and our SEHI. This picture captured, captures the formation of an unusual pre-planetary nebula with the catchy title of IRA, IRAS 23166-1655, a round star LL Pegasi in the constellation of Pegasus. The image shows what happens to be a thin spiral pat pattern of astonishingly regular wind, uh, wind, winding around, winding, I guess they call it, around the star, which is itself hidden behind thick dust. The spiral pattern suggests a regular periodic origin of a nebulous shape. The material forming the spiral is moving outwards at a speed of about 50,000 kilometers an hour. By combining this speed with the distance between layers, astronomers have calculated that the shells are each separated by 800 years. So that's that um, pattern that you're seeing uh, right here. Another great photo this week was from NASA's Orion capsule from 80 miles above the lunar surface. Uh, on November 21st, it took this delightful picture of Earth peeking around from the moon. When's the last time you saw one of those, hey? A long time ago, 1972. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still not flat. <laughs> That's right. Some just, uh, just released news from the James Webb telescope is that the, the mystery molecule found in the atmosphere of the WASP, uh, and uh, if you don't know what WASP is, it is the wide angle search for planets. That's what WASP means. Uh, back in August, it's defined as sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is created by interactions with photons from WASP's nearby star. Now, chemical reactions are caused by starlight. I'm going to show you this if I can get that to show. I'm going to try to make that bigger. There we go. Now, although sulfur dioxide is a great preservative and an antioxidant in dried fruit, fruits, it is a uh, fruitcake time of the year. If any of you remember the story of the great smog of 1952 in London, where 12,000 people died, plus animals, it was related to sulfur dioxide being changed into sulfuric acid in the atmosphere due to a combination of factors from coal burning. I wouldn't want WASP minus 39B on a Christmas travel itinerary anytime soon. So get ready, get set, and start those advent calendars. Uh, uh, come on, you stupid mouse. <laughs> the worst. Uh, come on. Can we can we ask for a donation for Paul for months? I need a month. <laughs> I killed three already. <laughs> so get ready, get set, and start for those Advent calendars on Thursday. It's how you make those chicken bone candies. <laughs> <laughs> I love chicken bones. This, yeah, yeah. this week's Rosanna's fun fact. <laughs>
Yeah. Hey. Hey. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. 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 Yeah. And um, yeah, St. Stephen, of course, is where the candies are. Uh, everybody knows mm. that it lives around this area. So it's interesting how they found out the distance between those rings, uh, almost like, I suppose, like rings of a tree, right? Yeah. And the idea, yeah. yeah. 800, um, 800 years apart. Yeah. Amazing. Wild, eh? An advent calendar for astronomy. That's a great idea. It's fantastic. Probably better than those little chocolates you used to get. Remember, you used to so pump we could have Mars in there. <laughs> yeah, that'd be better. <laughs> like, like Beatrice is talking about real, uh, real uh, Belgian chocolate, so Beatrice can probably donate it to us. So, oh, we'll wait for those. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Beatrice. Send it in. Dollar store chocolate. Dollar stores are out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, thank, thank you, thank you Rosanna, much. once again. Fantastic. All right, let's go with. Uh, how about we go with what's up then next? Um, Oh, I guess that's me. What's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? Okay. Let me share my screen. <laughs> and it should open up down there in a second. Uh, let me show. Okay. There, that should be. There we are. There we are. Okay. Uh, what's up this week? Well, let's take a look. A um, few things happening this week. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at uh, tomorrow evening where our moon greets uh, Saturn. Uh, tomorrow evening, our waxing crescent moon greets the ring beauty Saturn. Saturn and our moon are about five degrees apart, which means they should fit together in the same field of view of a set of 10 by 50 binoculars. Now, we'll lose Saturn in our evening sky very soon, so it's always good uh, to go out and try to catch it, uh, catch a glimpse of it soon. If you haven't looked at it yet, you want to get at it pretty soon because it's starting to get fairly low in the sky. The western sky now. Um, I got these in order. Maybe I do. I don't know. <laughs> if I don't, oh, whatever. Okay. No, they're not in order. Anyway, uh, Thursday, December 1st, uh, our moon greets Jupiter. On Thursday evening, look to the sky uh, to witness our waxing gibbous moon as it greets the king of planets, Jupiter, and its Galilean moons. Now, Jupiter and our moon will appear just three degrees apart, easily fitting together in the field of view of most binoculars or a small telescope. You can see I wrote this what's up in the middle of the night because it was spelling oof more <laughs> <laughs> i gotta stop doing these things in the middle of the night ah see we're back to wednesday again now okay wednesday november 30th first quarter moon our first quarter moon arrives on wednesday morning at 10 36 atlantic time now the first quarter moon is always a perfect time to try and check out the many interesting features with their long shadows on or near that line that we call the terminator the one that separates day and night on the moon here so always a great time to check out the moon at first quarter for sure. Um, also on Wednesday, um, the Lunar X and the Lunar V. I believe the Lunar V will be visible as well. The Lunar X is going to be tough to find, though, because Wednesday evening presents an opportunity to check out a couple of interesting features. Uh, sunset on that day, though, is at 4.43 Atlantic times. So uh, Lunar X are best seen right around 5 o'clock. Um, so you'll need to have a sharp eye at the eyepiece to pick them out with minimal contrast between the moon and daylight. But you should be able to get them. We've got them before like that. Uh, Thursday, December 1st, we have the lunar straight wall. On day eight of the lunar cycle, a prominent feature can be found, the lunar straight wall. Now, the straight wall, or rupus recta is called, is a 110-kilometer-long uh, fault line <clears throat> on the moon with a very gentle slope. Now, in fact, if you were walking down the slope, you might not even realize it. But to us, it appears as a very steep cliff. And that, that's just a trick with light and shadows visible right around first quarter. So here we are at first quarter. And we have this long, steep kind of a cliff and the shadow marks. Um, in a third quarter, it's just the opposite. You can't see it at all. Also on Thursday, here we go back. We're flipping back and forth here. Uh, Thursday, December 1st, Io and it's... Uh, Moon, uh, sorry, Io, and its shadow transit Jupiter. <clears throat> On Thursday evening, watch a mini solar system in motion uh, as Jupiter's smallest Galilean moon, Io, and its shadow transit across the face of the giant planet. Now, Io will transit from 2126 Atlantic time to 2339, and it will be followed by its shadow from 2243 to 2455. So lots of time there to catch out that shadow, a couple hours anyway, uh, to watch that pass over um, Transit across the face of Jupiter. If you haven't seen one yet, it's pretty neat to see this little dark spot. You you get up and you wipe off your eyepiece and you think there's something on your a piece of dirt in your eyepiece. It's really not. <laughs> it's, it's more of a shadow. Also coming up uh, Thursday, December the 1st, is Mars's closest approach. 
Now that's not Mars at opposition, it's just, but it is at its closest approach. Now Thursday evening, the red planet Mars will make its closest approach to Earth. This is not opposition. Mars closest approach occurs when the two planets are 81.4 million kilometers apart. Uh, these are the days to get out and check out the bright planet, easily visible now with, with the naked eye as well. It's almost as bright as Jupiter. It appears almost as bright as Jupiter, but it's pretty easy to spot sitting in around uh, Taurus right now. You can see the different sizes of uh, how the planet appears as we approach it. Um, the big day, though, is going to be opposition day coming up uh, on December the 8th, 7th when the moon will pass in front of it. Uh, another fascinating feature, though, to catch this week is Jupiter's great red spot, uh, an anticyclone about the size of two Earths that has been raging on Jupiter for about 400 years now. Winds about 350 kilometers per hour. So always nice to see that too, through a telescope. Pretty neat to see. I'll move on to Saturday uh, in the St. John Astronomy Club. If you happen to be in the local area, you may be interested in participating in one of our local astronomy meetings. Now, the next meeting is on December the 3rd, beginning at 7 p.m. The meetings are, boy, my spelling is really bad here. The meetings are both informal and informative and are suitable for ages 12 and up. And we uh, even have telescopes that we lend out free of charge. So you can find out more at our website, sjastronomy.ca. And I like to go refer to Lisa's lookup. This is uh, Lisa's uh, chart. If you can find her at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Twitter, she has Mastodon there again now, okay, <laughs> and Facebook. Uh, so she lists um, the event, the date, and the peak time for uh, viewing that event and what you need to see it with, either naked eye, binoculars, or a telescope. So find her at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Twitter, Mastodon, and Facebook. Thanks, Lisa. This is our chart for December, so it's creeping up on us. And uh, our St. John Astronomy Club also has this calendar in conjunction with the RASC uh, New Brunswick, uh, which is the November-December calendar, which Kurt Nason puts together here for us. Does a great job on it every every month. Uh, this takes us right up to the 17th of December, but this is where I go to pick out some of the uh, interesting events that are happening uh, throughout the week. So thank you, Kurt. And that should be it for that part of the show. All right. And that's why you're right. Ah. Hmm. A little mixed up, but it's there. Yeah. It's all happening next week. It's all happening next week. <laughs> well, actually, it's all happening the following week because on the 7th to the 8th is the, is the next big event. And that is when the moon will occult Mars from our position here in St. John, at least, um, from about 12.02 a.m. on the 8th to about 12.36, I believe it is, on the 8th. Um, so just after midnight, we'll probably go live. I'm trying to talk these two guys into it, uh, that we might go live on that evening. Um, what Mars should be up pretty high. Hmm? Oh, sorry, I was just going to ask, um, I don't know if I can get the moon this time of the year, uh, from my, uh, place because it's not very high. Well, that'd be a midnight for me. So the moon would be almost due south. Hmm. Yeah, I, I won't get it. Right no. Okay, well, we were not going to invite you. Yeah. You, can, you can watch the show then, Paul. Never mind. Sure. <laughs> hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. <laughs> you can narrate. <laughs> yeah. You can do an animation. I like that time when you were out in your front yard with your phone there. We can do that. Yeah. <laughs> Same idea. <laughs> there you go. So, we, uh, I mean, it, it, I did ask her, I said, how rare is this? You know, and it is fairly rare that not just the fact, I mean, the moon does occult other objects in the sky, stars, and other objects uh, and planets, you know, at, at times, uh, but to have the full moon occult another planet when that planet is actually at opposition at the same evening that that planet is at opposition, that's pretty rare. Yeah. Uh, really extremely rare, I guess. And especially with Mars, um, there, Kurt says, this is a Taurus, it's nice and high. Uh, so uh, it's extremely rare to have that happen because it takes Earth two years, really, to catch up to, to Mars every every time that we catch up to it, right? We don't catch up to it every year because Mars is actually moving around uh, pretty quick as well. So so for those th things to all happen together, it does make it a fairly uh, rare event. So we'll hope to, hopefully we'll have some clear skies and we'll be able to offer it. So we'll leave it at that. Okay, let's go from there then to, uh, I wanted to do a quick uh, view of some photos. Photo submissions for the week. And I gotta get my notes up for my photos. 
think here's my notes here. Did you want a binocular challenge? Oh, yes, I do. Let's go with that first. I didn't, forgot to add that to the list, Mike. Let's bring up a oh, no challenge. Hopefully it's coming up there. It is. So, binocular moon crater challenge this week. Well, last time it was Alphonsus, and there's Alphonsus right in here. Now, I know that uh, the Terminator line is, is uh, moving a little further. We skipped a couple of weeks there, so the, the moon's not in the exact same spot as it was, but or the, you know, the craters and stuff aren't lit up as, as the order they should be. But moving on anyway, for next week, it is, or this week, it's our, no, our Ezekiel, our Ezekiel, our Ezekiel. Our Ezekiel, Close yep. enough. Has a diameter of 96 kilometers and a depth of 3.6 kilometers. The rim shows little sign of wear and a detailed terrace structure in the interior, especially on the slightly higher eastern rim. The rugged central peak is prominent, rising 1.5 kilometers above the floor and is somewhat offset to the west with a bowed curve uh, from south to north northeast. The floor is relatively flat. There is a rill, Paul. <laughs> really? <laughs> System named <laughs> Remy Ezekiel <laughs> and runs from the northern wall to the southeast rim. So you want to go out and look for this Ezekiel on the moon. And That's a fantastic crater. Lots of lots of lots of detail in there. Lots of features. All kinds. Mm. And that's our moon challenge binocular target. How's awesome. That? Thanks, Mike. Now stop share. There we go. We should be able <laughs> to get up. that one. We should be able to get that one before the next show, anyway. Yeah, I think okay. you will. It's in the right spot. Okay, let's go down to uh, some photos. And I got to share my screen. Photos. Share my screen. Hang I on, love right. photos. Yes, we're going to share the screen. It'll be at 25 degrees in the sky when that occultation takes place. Okay. And uh, I can't get my uh, the moon at 25 degrees when it's that far south. Okay. Because my house blocks it. Well, get on the roof. <laughs> What's the matter, Paul? Like you get a roof there, don't you? Do, do your neighbors have a roof? You're kind of in a low spot, so one of your neighbors wouldn't mind. Do you have a dwarf pedestal? <laughs> Does anybody out there have a tree stand? That's just my kitchen table. You see my kitchen table? <laughs> <laughs> no excuses, son. You know, like really, like you know, just these are lame, Paul. So, yeah, anyway. no, I'll, have to, I'll have to take a telescope and put it out somewhere else, people see it. <laughs> okay. Well, well, we'll expect you to do that. <laughs> All right. Robert, get at Mike's Lunar Challenge, Alphonsus Crater. Yes, sir. There we go. He got it. Very well, Robert. Done. There it is. There it is. Nice capture, Robert. And he updated, uh, he said, updated processing for the double cluster in Perseus and the Heart and Soul Nebula in Cassia Cassiopeia. Now, I got to make sure that you guys aren't showing on the screen here. You're showing on my screen, but you're not on the... Okay, you're not out there. Okay, perfect. You're showing large. Very okay. large. <laughs> All right, there we there go. There you go. There's uh, a double cluster. Look at yeah. that. Heart, soul, double cluster, all right there, right? Man, awesome. there's a lot of stars in that neighborhood. Is there a river, eh? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's some thick part of the, of the galaxy. Love looking at that kind of stuff. <laughs> star fields are just, they just, my favorite. Oh, well, so. globular clusters are my favorite, but star fields are pretty close second. Thank you, Robert. Yes. Well okay, done. we're going to go to Matthew Dupre now. Um, my submission for the week, he says, uh, finally some clear skies. I got to, out to capture Mars last night. Yeah, nice shot. Is that, eh? Where's the, the nice blower cap? Wow. Mm. Uh, look, look at everything on it. I mean, there's yeah, so much surface. So much, so much detail coming out on these images now that people are sending in because we're so close to opposition, right? Yeah. 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 That's um, a beautiful shot. The last it, time uh, it was this close, it was a couple of years ago, and we get sandstormed out, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's still hard to like. Uh, I you'd see the features, but like, what is that all about? You know, you, it it draws your mind into it, like to, your curiosity takes over, right? Like whatever exactly we're looking at here. Well, it's a butterfly on Mars. Well, it is that. Okay, <laughs> that too. All right. <laughs> you see the man in the moon. We got the butterfly on Mars. Got it in the face on Mars. Yeah. Okay, uh, he says, uh, I use my Celestron 9 and a quarter, three times Barlow, and ASI 224 to capture 10,000 frames. 
and then stacked at the best 20% in auto stackered and sharpened them in Registacks and in Photoshop. So well, well done. done. Yeah, very well nice. done, Matthew. Very, very nice. Okay, we're going to move from there into Jeremy Costain, who sent this one in from a blurry, but uh, uh, blurry moon. He says, but through binoculars plus a zoom on the phone. So not bad for that. Right on. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got it. Beautiful. Thanks, Jeremy. Was what, what looking that last night coming home? We were out and uh, looked at that Earth shine and that moon. It's just something about that face. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. It's yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love that face. Yeah. Yeah. It's so it hangs so heavily at the and uh, uh, near the horizon. Yeah, and it's and it's low when you see it when it gets dark. It's just so amazing. Yeah, very colorful too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Adrian McCreech sent this one in. She said, "No editing, no editing." This was from Belfast, Ireland. Wow, oh, cool, eh? So beautiful morning sky. She said, "So that's awesome. Nice to see. You. Thank you for that, Adrian." Nice. Yeah, all the way from Ireland. I uh, get this one from Kathy, I believe. Is this Kathy's or is it? Uh, hang on. Yeah, Kathy Adams. Jupiter last night. Uh, seeing was average and it was cold, she said. The great red spot is just rotating out of sight. Um, Astro surface for stacking and wavelets followed by Photoshop. Wow. That That's one nice. Well done. Very nice. Mm. Very red well spot done. Right there, just about to rotate over. Yep. Yeah. There's another capture. Oh, sweet. Lined up there nicely. Three moons. There right? she's. Yeah. There, you get them all lined up. Yeah, yeah. Well done, Kathy. Kathy, you're doing amazing work. Yeah, it looks good. Um, Mr. Powell. Yeah. This one, last night. That was last night when we were down at the, the IKYC lookout. Right. I was offering the, the YouTube view there. Mike was set up with his uh, 600 millimeter, Mike. Yeah, camera. my new lens, a 150 lens. 600 millimeter Sigma. Mm. There you go. That's what you got there, so yeah. Amazing. Really nice. <laughs> lots, lots of detail there. Look at that, Mark Marisma, that, that teddy bear. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look at that. It is a teddy bear, yeah. <laughs> I know you don't see it, Chris, but... No, I see a couple <laughs> eyeballs. I see a couple eyeballs. <laughs> there oh, go. there it is. Here it is. Yeah, there uh, it is. Yeah, there's there's the two eyes, the nose. Yeah. I mean, nose. That's it's about it. as bare as you can bear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> and uh, his capture from tonight, Mike. Eh? That was tonight, yeah, before it clouded over from the driveway. Uh, what a difference in the phases, eh? How much more yeah. you see from Just one to So look at look right at where Mar Mar Charisma is, how yeah. where the, uh, where the then, moon is shining. And and there, yeah. yeah, and it's really moved a long way. Mm, in one night. In one night. Oh, yeah, in just 12 hours because that was the daytime. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that was uh, about two hours difference in 24 hours. Right. So, but that's what makes the moon so interesting to uh, photograph and study is because mm -hmm. you see these different phases and you every, see, you're, seeing, you're getting different features every night, right? Yeah. Every night and every month. Like you can, you know, yeah. if you can't, if you miss the, the 11%. Illuminated moon this month, we'll catch it next month or yeah. the month after that. You know, yeah. Yeah. the fantastic part is that it's always there. It's, it's our it's coming back. It keeps coming back. You know, it does. you can study the moon uh, easily that way. It's like debt in your credit card, just keeps coming back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially this time of year. <laughs> okay, we got this one from Chris Benoit. Chris says, oh, uh, I like the black and white. He said, from the image I took, uh, learning to shoot uh, with H alpha filter. So that looks yeah. like, I, that's the, the heart, is it not? I think so. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it's uh, the Malat 15, the bright portion mm -hmm. of it in the center. Yeah, that's the heart nebula. Yeah. Nicely yeah. done, Chris. Yep. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, we're going to move to another Mars image here. Um, and this one is from David Hoskin. Mars imaged at 8.50 p.m. on November 24th with my Celestron C8, SCT, and ASI 224 MC camera. Well done. Yes, sir. Yeah, you still nice. see the butterfly. Yeah, sir. Yeah. yeah, polar caps are right there. Polar caps. Yeah, you're right, Paul. It's nice to see it without the dust storm for sure. Yeah, oh, it's it's yeah. just unbelievable. Mm, good detail. If you get a chance, anybody that you want to see something amazing, uh, there's one guy who does uh, two guys actually that do amazing planetary work. Chris Go was one, mm -hmm. and Damien <clears throat> Peach is the other. Damien Peach, that's right. Uh, the potential in this hobby. Uh, check out some of their work because either one of them are yeah, just fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't choose between the two. They're both so good. <laughs> oh well, yeah, I mean, yeah, they're they're the best. But yeah, but they're but the people like like we're seeing here now 
are getting in, you know, are starting to get more towards that capability. Yeah. But if you really want to see the potential, look at those other people that are doing it. Right. And, and, and you, they'll, they'll tell you exactly how they captured it and, yeah. you know, the processes that they took. Yeah. And you'll learn stuff from these guys. So. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah. Um, we got this one from uh, David as well. Uh, Jupiter in Io. Uh, image at 8 30 p- uh, this evening he says with my celestron it was last night i guess celestron c8 sct and asi 224 mc camera as well so they rare jupiter and Isle. yes sir yeah really nice well done there's actually quite a little uh detail on that little moon there is yeah yeah on the moon as well. yeah there's a little bit of chromatic aberration but you can see that there's you know there is surface there's something going on yeah yeah it's not just a blob of white yeah right? yeah very nice nicely done Okay, I'm going to move from there to Carol Bean's capture from tonight of the oh, crescent sweet. moon from oh, St. Stephen. Mm. Love it. Love it once yeah. through the clouds, eh? Yeah, she's just some great captures. Yeah, terrific. Well done. Thanks, Carol. Now I'm going to move there from, uh, to Gail and Michelle. I'm going to zoom out of this one, though, but here's a capture. I'll talk a little bit about this. I hope you don't mind, she says, me sending this over. Just watch a stream of what appeared to be orange-tinged lights from Homestead Road in Moncton. Seems interesting. Now, I believe that was on last Sunday night. And I know I get a lot of images that were sent in, or people are asking anyway, about what they had seen overhead. And we believe that might have been Mike, the rocket body that uh, we talked about last Sunday night. Well, that was the only thing that was listed in that time frame, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, good, good chance that that's what it was. Uh, Galen can send in images here anytime at all, whatever you like, for sure. I'm going to move on to Susan Kovacs, though. Uh, Susan Kovacs Thorndike. And she says, oh, have I got the right one? No, I haven't. i got to go back and try to find her. Just a second here. Might have to zoom out of this one. No, it was a, it's actually a video. So I might have to close this and try to find it. Hang on one second. Do-do-do-do-do. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> do, 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 do. Okay, I think it's this is it here. And maybe this one will play. And is I got an picture? It. No, uh, it's actually. A <laughs> you need a telescope to find it? No, I'm going to bring it right down here. So here it is. This is one of them. Uh, she says, Hi, Chris. Back in March, <clears throat> I sent photos of the northern lights captured on my security camera. Not much happening until recently. So far in November, though, she says, My cameras three of them have caught videos of meteorites a total of nine so far oh wow and i gotta try to snap it on here so watch this oh wow oh nice um she said total of nine so far i thought you uh like to view the one from early this morning november the 25th at 12 11 a.m i will send a video hope you enjoy it um can i go back here you guys are covering my damn picture or my darn excuse me my picture here we go there you go Wow. Oh, okay, that's, that's that one. Now let's go with the other one here. So bright when they burn like that, hey? Yeah. yeah. Is this the second one or is that the same one? Oh, there it is. Look at that. Look at that, that one. Oh, wow. How do you like that one? <laughs> wow. Very nice. Yeah. So get out your security cameras and uh, set them up in the sky. because there's Look, we haven't cleared our path. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, give it up, Mike. The proof is in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Susan, for those. Uh, yeah, a lot of people are, are capturing fireballs this, this, this go around. And um, <laughs> it's getting pretty interesting to see people uh, sending them in and stuff. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about that, too, uh, just quickly. Yeah. Good. Okay, so um, what I try to tell people is to maybe to visit this site, uh, amsmeteors.org, which is the American Meteor Society. It was founded in 1911. And... Uh, in here, you can find this link up at the top saying "Report a Fireball," and they love to get these. Um, let me move you guys over this side. There we go. Okay. So, how to report a fireball? Well, it's fun and easy. You saw something bright and fast, like a huge shooting star. Report it. It may be a fireball. We're going to ask you to fill out an interactive form that is intended to be uh, easy to fill out for anyone. Please be as precise as you can. Report is important. It alerts us to potentially scientifically significant ef- events that occur and contributes to the general database of knowledge about meteors. You will have the opportunity to give us all the details about your sighting experience at the end of the form. Now it says, please don't report sightings that lasted more than 30 seconds. The vast majority of those are only, uh, fireballs are only visible for a few seconds. Please don't report recurring events, like seeing a fireball is extremely rare and only a once in a lifetime event. 
So if it's something that happens over and over again, it's probably not a fireball. Please don't report slow blinking objects or lights crossing the sky um, because that's usually uh, a plane. And please don't report comet like rocket launches that appear for several minutes. Now, so here's some of the examples. Please only report fireballs, bright shooting stars like these ones at the top. Uh, anything that you see that's similar to this. You know, this is a to catch something like that. Eh? Mm, this is like a rocket launch here. This is one of the SpaceX rocket launches. And there's the satellite trains that we see going yeah. over. So they wouldn't be reported. No, but that one, the top one and the, the, fo the, yeah. fourth, one, the fourth one over. Yeah, that would be awesome to see something Catch like that. That angle, like that yeah. would just. That's a Tim. That's a Tim Doucette holding up his camera. Just yeah, going, yeah, Click. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tim's probably got a whole wall. On him. Yeah. He probably does. <laughs> <laughs> the luckiest guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's. So if you do go in and report the fireball, uh, here's some. Here's where you can go after that. So when you go back out again to the main page, you'll see this link called events, and I went into the events page uh, for last Saturday or last Sunday, which is here on the twentieth. And we can see here that people from the U.S. and Canada, and specifically Maine, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia, reported that one last Sunday night at 21.56 universal time, which would have been 5.56 our time, which is exactly when it happened. And um, from that, they can do this, see? So you can go back and take a look at this kind of a chart. And uh, here are all the people that had, spot, that had submitted reports. And from the reports, they would say, hey, it's coming. I saw it from the from the top left going to the bottom right or from the bottom right to the top left, whatever. And it shows where the people were and what direction they were looking. And then they can pretty well plan out that trajectory or take a look at what the trajectory was of that object. And look where it passes, just almost right over St. John, right? Yeah. So that's their best guess of what it was or what, where it was. And then it says at the top, this was not a fireball, probably a space debris and reentry. So... That helps to explain what you've what you've seen. And here are all the witness reports down here on the left hand side that gave them that led them to this conclusion. So uh, this is where it's it's fun to, to report the fireball, and you can go back in a few days later and see how many other people saw the same object. They might get an answer to your question of what what exactly was. So I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to just take a second and mention our current shoot the moon contest that's going on right now. Um, and we did mention it last week. We talked all about it last week. I've got the post up on my Facebook page. It's up on Instagram right now as well. Uh, so anybody who would like to enter the contest, it's open now until the uh, 15th of the month of December. Contest rules again for age 12 and under. If you had a Cliff Valley Astronomy Star Party, draw what you might see in the telescope. Pretty simple. If it's an alien, that's fine too. Uh, have a parent snap a photo of your drawing and send it into this address, astronomybythebay at gmail.com. That's where I'm collecting all of the entries, I'm trying to get them all into one place so I don't miss any of them. That's my problem. I've done that before and I don't want to do it again. Contest rules for age 12 and over. Capture a new image of the moon with any device. Send your entries into the same address, astronomybythebay at gmail.com. There's no judging ever. All images are treated equally. We'll just go to a random draw. Uh, share the post that I put up on Facebook or Instagram for a second entry and capture one of the planets for a third entry. Deadline for the entries again is midnight on the Thursday, December the 15th. We will draw for it that, that following Sunday night on our Sunday night show, which will be our last Sunday night astronomy show until after Christmas. And here are the prizes. Um, a two-hour private star party offered by, by Stefan Picard of Cliff Alley Astronomy uh, for up to 12 people. Uh, three. Celestron uh, 50 millimeter and 60 millimeter uh, telescopes and a nice uh, uh, four and a half inch. Um, what am I trying to say, guys? <clears throat> StarSense with StarSense technology, uh, Newtonian uh, reflector telescope as well. A Monopoly uh, space game, a uh, couple of RAS calendars and Observer's Handbook 2023. So lots of nice prizes for all ages. So get your entries in. And we'd love to see as many as we can get. And if you'd like to send in your photos, please send them in to astronomybythebay at gmail.com, even for this uh, program now. I'm trying to get them all to one location so I can get everything into one spot and I'm able to uh, determine what everything, where everything should be from there. So send them in to astronomybythebay at gmail.com. And that should be it, I think, guys. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Our, uh, our donor did a great job on that, I think. Oh, yes. Very, very well done. Very, very well done. 
Uh, we're not sure what next week's topic is going to be. I don't think we talked about that, guys, tonight. But we'll 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 think we'll think of something. We'll think of something for sure. Okay. Yeah. Is Jupiter uh, a planet? Oh, there you go. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> Do we want to go there? <laughs> sure, why not? He says. <laughs> okay. Well, then. Uh, hang on a second. I get my notes in the right location. <laughs> Too many screens going on. Okay. Remember now that our contest is on now, and remember to send your entries into a SNAZ, at a, or I'm sorry, at astronomybythebay at gmail.com. I just set up that address last week, so I got to start to remember it. And so in closing tonight, we want to thank you once again for your continued support of our efforts here. A special thanks once again, of course, to Rosanna for her continued contributions to our program. Rosanna, you've been uh, a significant part of the program from the very beginning, and we really do appreciate all of your contributions, so thank you. Um, we also uh, hope that all of you who have joined us from Rogers enjoyed the program tonight. Now, if you would like more information about the wonders of the night sky, you can contact me at astronomybythebay.ca. Also, a special thanks to all of you who share our program. We really appreciate it. Remember, too, we do love getting your photos, so send them in to astronomybythebay at gmail.com, and we will be happy to include them on our next broadcast. If you have a suggestion for a topic for a future show, please send it in to the same address. And please let your friends and family know, too, that we will be back uh, next Sunday night for a couple of more weeks anyway uh, at 8 p.m. on YouTube and Facebook to edutain you on astronomy and the wonders of the night sky. So for now, then, from Mike and Paul and myself, we wish you a very safe week, everybody. Lots of clear skies. And as we like to say, guys, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes. Run it up. Good night, everyone. Good night.